Good everybody. Over the course of uh, five days around the New Year's holiday, Russia launched repeated waves of aerial attacks against Ukraine. These massive bombardments used drones and missiles to strike cities and civilian infrastructure all across the country. Strikes reportedly hit a maternity hospital, a shopping mall, residential areas, killing dozens of innocent people and injuring hundreds more. As Russia continues to launch these brutal attacks, the United States has new information to share about the support that Russia is receiving from third countries. Due in part to our sanctions and export controls, Russia has become increasingly isolated on the world stage, and they've been forced to look to like-minded states for military equipment. As we've been warning publicly, one of those states is North Korea. Our information indicates that the Democratic People's Republic of Korea recently provided Russia with ballistic missile launchers and several ballistic missiles. On the 30th of December, 2023, Russian forces launched at least one of these North Korean ballistic missiles into Ukraine. This missile appears to have landed in an open field in the Zaporizhia region. And on January 2nd, Russia launched multiple North Korean ballistic missiles into Ukraine, including as part of its overnight aerial attack. We're still assessing the impacts of these additional missiles. We're releasing a graphic here, which you can see behind me, that documents the launch of these missiles from Russia into Ukraine. And as you can see, the graphic shows the area from which Russia launched the North Korean supplied ballistic missiles on those two dates, as well as the impact location inside Ukraine of the missile that was launched on the 30th of December. And as I said, we're still assessing the impacts of the other additional missiles that were launched on the 2nd. We expect Russia and North Korea to learn from these launches. And we anticipate that Russia will use additional North Korean missiles to target Ukraine's civilian infrastructure and to kill innocent Ukrainian civilians. These North Korean ballistic missiles are capable of ranges of approximately 900 kilometers. That's about 550 miles. This is a significant and concerning escalation in the DPRK's support for Russia. Now, in return for its support, we assess that Pyongyang is seeking military assistance from Russia, including fighter aircraft, surface-to-air missiles, armored vehicles, ballistic missile production equipment or materials, and other advanced technologies. This would have concerning security implications for the North, or, I'm sorry, for the Korean Peninsula and the Indo-Pacific region. We've also said publicly that Russia is seeking to acquire close-range ballistic missiles from Iran. At this time, we do not believe that Iran has delivered close-range ballistic missiles to Russia. However, the United States is concerned that Russian negotiations to acquire close-range ballistic missiles from Iran are actively advancing. According to press reporting, in September of 2023, Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, hosted Russian Defense Minister Shoigu in Iran and showcased its Ababil close-range ballistic missile and other missile systems. This event marked the first public display of ballistic missiles to a senior Russian official visiting Iran since February 2022. More recently, in mid-December, the IRGC Aerospace Force deployed multiple ballistic missile and missile support systems to a training area inside Iran for display to a visiting Russian delegation. We assess that Russia intends to purchase missile systems from Iran. So in response to Russia's activities with Iran and North Korea, we are taking a range of steps with our allies and our partners. First, Russia's procurement of ballistic missiles from the DPRK directly violates multiple UN Security Council resolutions. We will raise these arms deals at the UN Security Council alongside our allies and partners, and we will demand that Russia be held accountable for, yet again, violating its international obligations. Second, we will impose additional sanctions against those working to facilitate arms transfers between Russia and the DPRK, and between Russia and Iran. Third. We will continue to release information to the public and expose these arms deals, as we are doing today, because we will not allow countries to aid Russia's war machine in secret. But here's the bottom line. The most effective response to Russia's horrific violence against the Ukrainian people is to continue to provide Ukraine with vital air defense capabilities and other types of military equipment. To do that, we need Congress to approve our supplemental funding request for Ukraine without delay. Russia is relying upon its friends to replenish its military stockpiles and enable its war against Ukraine. Iran and the DPRK are standing with Russia. The Ukrainians deserve to know that the American people and this government will continue to stand with them. So it's critical that Congress meets this moment and responds by providing Ukraine with what they need to defend themselves. The time for Congress to act is now. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, John, do, can you talk a little bit about how you obtained the information? Where did it um, come from? And then also, uh, do you have any idea whether there are more the the that Ukraine or sorry that Russia has more from the DPRK coming as well, or have they sort of exhausted DPRK and now they're moving on to Iran to Iran? So on your first question, I'm, I have to be, I think you understand, I'm, I have to be very careful here. Uh, we have uh, been able to downgrade this information to provide to you today. Um, uh, as you know, intelligence is a mosaic, and we get information from many different sources that are corroborated and knit together to create the fabric that you saw today. Um, so I'm not going to really be able to go into great detail about uh, all the pieces that that helped us put this together, but it was a, a wide range of uh, intelligence sources over a period of time. As for their inventory now, um, uh, again, I want to be careful here, but we, I would just put it this way, that we, uh, we haven't seen anything that would tell us that Russia is not still reliant on munitions and missiles from, from North Korea. And as you remember, we also downgraded some information months ago about their procurement of artillery shells. So this is a relationship that has been ongoing, um, and uh, we're obviously deeply concerned that it appears to still be in force, and that's why we're going to take those those actions here at the at the UN. And in regards to Iran, how close is Russia to obtaining or to purchasing um, missiles from Iran? All I can tell you is what I said at the top, which is we have not seen them consummate a deal for close-range ballistic missiles. Good, Michael. Um, <coughs> uh, Admiral D. In, I think you said in your topper that you sort of attributed part of the reason that that Russia is having to go to these sources to the success of American sanctions uh, in, aimed at their domestic production. <coughs> but in our our reporting suggests that intelligent uh, that um, there is intelligence that the domestic production of missiles inside of Russia has largely recovered, and in fact now the daily production of missiles inside Russia by Russia's own manufacturing system has now exceeds what it was pre-war. So it, it, how much does the U.S. government believe they really need these North Korean and Iranian systems, or is it just that that is the sort of more scary part, that, that they're getting some different systems than they have the capability to build? Or what, what's, what, what difference does it make that they're, that they're getting them from North Korea if they have the production capabilities to do it themselves? Well, there's a lot, awful lot there, Mike. I, it's it, um, uh, so. First of all, it's not just U.S. sanctions and export controls. It's really an international effort to put pressure on his war-making ability, and we do believe it has been effective. I mean, he he's now he's out able to produce Iranian-designed drones on Russian soil because of this deal he's got with uh, Iran. And as we've talked about, he's going to countries like North Korea for additional munitions, no, missiles, and artillery shells. Uh, uh, I, I can't speak to the degree to which his defense industry has somehow managed to overcome the pressure. I would argue that we don't believe that it has fully circumvented and, and been able to, um, to thrive under the international economic pressure that, that he's under. We still believe that the export controls and the sanctions that we and our partners have put in place have had a, a detrimental effect on his ability uh, his defense industrial cap capacity. That does not mean that he hasn't tried to uh, improve and increase that capacity. Uh, he has. We've talked about this many times. I mean, um, his war-making machine is still capable. Um, and to the last part of your uh, question, uh, it's, it's not, we're not seeing anything that would tell us that these particular capabilities add something he doesn't already have. He had already had a pretty sophisticated missile capability before he decided to invade Ukraine. But it certainly is additive to his capability. And as he tries to, again, without getting into a debate about how much he has or hasn't improved his defense industrial base, as he certainly tries to recover from the pressure he's under, this, these are additive elements to his ability to continue to hit civilian infrastructure. It is, though, of a piece of a larger effort by, by Mr. Putin to weaponize the winter, to, to target specific civilian uh, infrastructure and, um, uh, and facilities uh, to try to break the back of the Ukrainian people.